Welcome to the ultimate guide to video production for churches. In this video, you are going to learn about the best tools and strategies for making better videos for your congregation and community. We will share with you our recommendations for cost-effective gear and software, including cameras, lenses, microphones, lighting rigs, as well as editing software. We're also gonna share how to avoid the most common mistakes and pitfalls we see church creatives and church leaders making when they're trying to produce videos for their congregation. So make sure you watch this video to the end because we cover the whole process. It's gonna save you time as well as money. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jake Goslin with churchfront.com and I'm joined by my friend, Spencer Trefsker. He's the creator of Church Video School. Make sure you do check out his YouTube channel because he's making content regularly to help you make better video for your church. Spencer and I have been friends for a few years now. We went to seminary together. We worked at a church together and he's even contributed a lot to the Church Front channel and Worship Ministry School, our online learning platform for worship leaders. And Spencer is a filmmaker. So a lot of the videos that you see here, he has helped out with as well as our courses and our master classes that we have filmed. So I thought he would be the best person since you guys often are the recipients of a lot of the content he helps us make. I thought it'd be great to have him on the channel to share his expertise on how to build the right video production setup and workflow for your church. We're gonna put timestamps for the different parts of this training below this video for your convenience to skip around if necessary. We also are going to link all of our gear and software down below this video as well. And if you just want one convenient central place to download all of the best video gear for churches, then check out Spencer's toolkit that he also has linked down below this video. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. In this video, we're gonna cover three main areas. We're gonna look at video gear and techniques for how your image looks. Then we're gonna talk about audio, how to use microphones, how to capture audio, and how to do some basic mixing. And at the very end, we're gonna go through an editing workflow from start to finish of a basic video that you can copy and paste into your own workflow for your church. So to begin, let's talk about resolution really quick. That's a question that still comes up. People still don't know what does it mean to have 4K, HD, full HD. And when you're looking to invest in a camera, you wanna know what you're getting. So really quickly, um, HD started as what we would now call 720p. That came out uh, maybe 15 years ago for broadcast TV. And then it progressed into 1080p full HD, which is the kind of standard for today. Um, and what's becoming the standard is what's called 4K, which is double the size of full HD. So it's double the width and double the height. When you're buying a camera, it's important to think about buying one that can capture 4K for a couple of reasons. The first is that it will last longer and it's going to have a longer shelf life for your church. The second reason is that if you're going to deliver projects in 1080p or lower, which is totally normal and fine, um, it gives you free crop so that if you frame something wrong, if you need to zoom in because you screwed it up the first time, you can do so without it looking blurred out or pixelated. And that's a really nice advantage to have, especially if you're shooting a talking head. Even if you didn't do it wrong, you can zoom in on that talking head almost 50 to 60%, and it looks like you have two cameras when you really just had one. And so that's the advantage of buying a camera that can capture in 4K. So when it comes to choosing which camera is right for your video production, uh, there's a few different factors that come into play. Number one, what's your budget? Number two, it's just what's the, the look that you're going for? So we have four main options that we can go with. First, you can go with your smartphone. If you have an iPhone, if you have an Android device, any of these latest smartphones out there have amazing cameras in there with great sensors, great little lenses. Another option is a simple, inexpensive camcorder. This is the Canon Vixia. HFR 800. In my opinion though, your smartphone is probably gonna get a much better image than this camcorder. The next option you can go, and this is when we start spending even more money, is a DSLR camera. So here we have the Canon 6D Mark II with a nice Canon lens on it. Um, and then very closely related to DSLRs, we have mirrorless cameras. This is a Panasonic GH4. We are filming this video on two Panasonic GH5s right now. Um, and those are really the four options. Mirrorless camera, DSLR, camcorder, and then smartphone. While you can make really great videos using your smartphone, um, or even a camcorder, we highly recommend going the mirrorless camera route. These cameras are small, 
They are very powerful. You can also switch out the lenses on them, which is gonna really help you achieve a more cinematic and professional look to your videos. When it comes to mirrorless cameras, there are a lot of great options out there and there are more every single month, it seems like. Three of our favorites are gonna be the Panasonic GH5, which is a micro four thirds sensor. We've used it for years. Every single church front video you've ever seen has been filmed on that. A step up from that is gonna be the Canon EOS R series. It's got a bigger sensor and it's a Canon, so it has great color science and better lenses, but it's gonna cost you a little bit more. And then the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K and 6K are amazing options. They're a little bit more modular. You're gonna to have to buy some accessories for them to work, but they have incredible image quality. While you can't go wrong with either of the three makes and models that Spencer just recommended, I find myself always encouraging people to go the route of the Panasonic GH5, or if you have a higher budget, go with the Canon EOS R. I love Blackmagic, but a lot of their gear is definitely suited to people who know a lot more the nuances of cinematography and filmmaking. So if you want a good run and gun camera that does good photos and videos, because the Blackmagic cameras aren't really made for photography, then go either the Panasonic or Canon route. And if you have more money and you want to build a more expensive system with better optics, then go the Canon route. I'm really excited about the new Canon EOS R5 that's coming out uh, in a few months. Hopefully it'll be available. It can shoot 8K. It's got in-body stabilizations. Lots of great benefits to that, which actually may make me switch from being a Panasonic user to a Canon user. So when you get your camera and you're ready to start filming, a thing that confuses a lot of people who are new at video is what frame rate should I be shooting at? There's a lot of options and it can be a little bit confusing, so let's make it simple. 24 frames per second or 23.98, depending on your camera, is going to be considered the cinema speed. That essentially means you're taking 24 pictures every second with your camera and blurring those together to make a moving image. 24 frames per second has a similar motion blur to what your human eye sees in real life, so it's a really smooth way of filming. 30 frames per second and 25 frames per second, depending on whether you're in the United States or overseas, are old standards from when we used to have to send everything over the airwaves and it was based on the electrical current speed that we use depending on the country you're from. That's still the TV standard, but more and more 24 frames per second is just becoming the normal filming standard for all areas, including all the church front videos you've ever seen. The only reason you'd need anything at 60 frames per second or faster is to create a slow motion effect in your editor. Your computer or your camera will slow down 60 frames per second or more to 24 if you tell it to so that you're fitting more pictures in per second and it gives the effect of being slow motion. A great tool that a lot of folks don't think about when they're building a video production setup uh, is a teleprompter. Here we have the Parrot teleprompter and what's awesome about this little guy is that it's simply gonna mount on the front of the lens of your camera and it's also very affordable. So there's lots of big, complicated, expensive teleprompters out there. But what you're gonna do is put this on the camera, like so, and then your smartphone is actually gonna mount uh, on the bottom of this teleprompter, kind of like this, and then the text from your script for whoever is talking or speaking will show up on the mirror and it's gonna look like they're talking into the camera lens. The reason why you may want one of these teleprompters is it's gonna really help out your pastor or church leader who maybe isn't used to doing a lot of on-camera talking. So with a teleprompter, they're gonna be able to type out their script ahead of time, give it to you, you're gonna put it in your phone app, you're gonna mount it on your camera, and then they can just speak directly to the camera and know exactly what they want to say. In my professional video practice, I have made it a requirement that my church or marketing clients use a teleprompter because it's amazing what happens to people who are really good at speaking when a lens is right in front of them and it seems to empty the brain. And so it's just a really helpful tool, especially if you want to keep things succinct. It helps you stay on script and it helps you know exactly how long your video is going to be so you don't have a 16 minute announcement video because if you're going to do that, you might as well just do it in person. So far, we've talked about video resolution and frame rates, as well as our favorite cameras out there. The next step in your video production setup is to smash the like button on this video. And then for real, the next step is actually lenses. So Spencer, tell us what we need to know about lenses. So the job of a lens on a camera is to let light through so that it can hit the sensor 
and make an image. Lenses come in different shapes and sizes and because of that, they have a different angle of view or perspective. Lenses are measured in millimeters from front to back as how deep they are. So you'll see 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter, 100 millimeter, and so on and so forth. The human eye equivalent field of view is 50 millimeters. So a lens that has a 50 millimeter perspective is going to look pretty much the same on camera as what the room around you does to your eye. Anything that's smaller than 50 millimeters, say this nine millimeter fisheye lens, which is an extreme example, or even a 35 millimeter, is going to have a wider field of view. So we call those wide angle lenses. They see more from the perspective that they are than you can with your normal eye. And on the inverse side, anything greater than 50 millimeters is going to be considered a telephoto lens. A telephoto lens gives the impression of being zoomed in. So this 85 millimeter lens right here is going to seem very, very zoomed in on this camera from the same perspective as a 50 millimeter or 25 millimeter would look. And you can tell this lens is obviously much bigger and more expensive. In layman's terms, the lower the millimeter number on the lens, the wider of an angle you can see, the higher the number, the tighter of an angle that you can see. One thing to be aware of when you're shopping for lenses, you really have to consider what's called crop factor. And this has to do with the size of the sensor that is on your camera. So the Panasonic GH5 has a micro four thirds sensor. It's a smaller sensor. The Canon EOS R series of cameras has a full frame sensor. It's just a larger sensor that is able to basically take in more light. But Spencer, tell us how that affects the overall perspective with your lenses. Yeah, so if you have a sensor that's smaller than 35 millimeters, which is considered full frame, it's going to have the optical effect of zooming in the perspective of the lens that you're using. A simple way to remember this is the crop factor. So a micro four thirds sensor, it has a crop factor of two, which means that a 25 millimeter lens on here, as measured by the actual size of the lens, has the equivalent value of a 50 millimeter perspective. So this 85 millimeter lens right here actually looks like 170 millimeters on a full frame camera. And if that doesn't make sense, just smash the like button on this video. <laughs> no, but seriously, it's good to know because when you're shopping for like glass or lenses for your Canon cameras, you'll just understand that, okay, a 50 millimeter on a Canon EOS R is the equivalent to like a 25 millimeter on a Panasonic GH4, GH5 camera. And you just don't wanna be caught off guard thinking that you're gonna have the look of a 50 millimeter lens uh, when you purchase it, but it ends up looking like a 100 millimeter lens, super zoomed in. So with all that said about the crop factor, full frame versus micro four thirds and how that affects your lenses, I wanna go ahead and just tell you our recommendations. If you had to pick one lens for your GH5 or your Canon EOS R, um, here are the lenses we recommend. For the GH5, I recommend this 12 to 60 millimeter lens. And we're gonna link all this down below uh, this video so you'll see exactly which one. But this 12 to 60 millimeter focal length allows you to have wide shots when you have the, the number you know, zoomed out down all the way to 12. Or if you need to zoom in, you can get more portrait shots at around you know, 25 millimeters. Or if you need a more telephoto shot, you can zoom all the way into uh, 60 millimeters. So this is just a really great flexible lens, uh, whether you're gonna be shooting videos outside of a worship setting um, to create an videos or any other creative videos for your church or if you need to use this you know for a uh capturing worship, you're gonna be able to use it as a telephoto or capturing the whole room wide. So very good workhorse lens. If you're gonna to go to the Canon EOS R route, I would recommend the 24 to 105 millimeter lens. It's kind of common, one of the kit lenses that comes with it. Again, a great walk around zoom camera that's gonna give you uh, the ability to go wide as well as get some portrait looks as well as zoom in for um, telephoto shots. And real quick, if you have the budget for a second lens for your video production setup, I'd recommend recommend a 50 millimeter prime lens if you have a Canon full frame camera. Um, and if you go the micro four thirds route with Panasonic, get a 25 millimeter prime lens. And we're gonna talk more about aperture in a few moments and why you would want one of these lenses, but basically it's gonna give you the ability to have some more creative shots, have really blurry backgrounds. It's gonna look more cinematic with that type of lens, more so than your zoom lens. The zoom has lots of flexibility with focal length and perspective of how wide or tight the shot is, but a prime lens like the 50 millimeter or 25 millimeter is gonna give you that more creative cinematic look. So if you're torn between getting a micro four thirds camera or getting a full frame camera, here are some factors to consider. A full frame camera is going to give you better low light 
performance because it lets more light in because the sensor is larger. So if you're in a dark environment like a worship space, it's going to be a better image. A full frame sensor is also going to give you a shallower depth of field, which essentially means you'll have a blurrier background at 50 millimeters with a full frame camera than you will at 50 millimeter equivalent on a micro four thirds camera. And that's really important to some people. If it's important to you, then that's the way to go. The downside of a full frame camera is that they are way more expensive right now if you're looking at them for video. The technology is just now advancing to the place where a full frame camera can process 4K video inside it without overheating, but because you're on the leading edge, you are going to be paying more for that. The lenses are also more expensive because they need to be bigger and have more glass in them for a full frame sensor. A Marco Four Thirds sensor is going to be a little bit more cost effective because the lenses are smaller and they're able to shoot 4K video easier because it's less processing power for a smaller sensor. So they have a little bit better options as far as 4K at 60 frames to get slow-mo and 4K, stuff like that. The downside is that you don't have that great shallow depth of field that you get with a full frame sensor and you get worse low light performance. So you'll have a lot more noise in your image and you won't be able to tolerate as much of a dark room setting um, that you will with the full frame. The other factor to consider when buying a lens is how wide open the aperture can go on that lens. So your aperture is measured with an f-stop. You'll see an f with a slash and then a number. That number is a ratio of how wide open the aperture inside your lens can get. So f 1.2 is almost completely wide open compared to the you know circumference of the lens, whereas f 4.5 is stopped down about halfway and f 16 is stopped down almost completely. The reason the reason that this matters is that if you have a lens that can go to f 1.4 or 1.2 or close to that, like a lot of prime lenses can, that is going to give you a lot shallower focus field, which is going to give you a more cinematic image and it also lets in a lot more light. A zoom lens like this 12 to 60 that we've been looking at can only open up to f 2.8 and if you open that zoom up all the way up to 60 millimeters, I think it goes almost to four as a minimum aperture setting just because of the mathematical ratio inside the glass. So your zoom lens is going to give you a lot of flexibility as far as the perspectives it can give you, but it does limit you a little bit as far as how much light you can work with and how much cinematic depth of field you can get in your images. All right, now that we've talked about kind of getting our setup put together, let's talk about how to use it. So when it comes to shooting a talking head video like this or like an announcement video or even a sermon video where you're talking to the lens, you need to frame your shot properly. Bad framing is going to make things seem either empty or too close or too far away and it's gonna look very amateurish and it's an easy fix. There's a couple of things to keep in mind when you're framing a shot. The first is perceived distance. This is how far away your subject looks from the camera. When you're shooting a talking head video like this, you want to frame the shot at a comfortable distance that mimics a conversation in real life. So what happens with a lot of people is they get way too far away and they can see almost the entire person in the shot because they wanna make sure they get it all. But that gives the impression that the person talking to me is on the other side of the room, which is unusual. And so it's not engaging and it makes me feel like I'm in the back of the classroom so I'm not gonna pay attention. The other way that people miss is getting way too close and cutting almost everything out but maybe the tops of the shoulders and the face. This is uncomfortable because it makes you seem like you're way too close to the person who's talking to you. And even though it's through video, the person watching wants to lean back and get some distance because it's just an awkward personal distance to have a conversation for a very long time with. So the Goldilocks principle is to be in between those two. I think mid torso and up is a great frame because it's a comfortable speaking distance, it's engaging, it's not too close, you don't feel like you're gonna smell their breath and it's not too far away where people feel like they're not engaged at all by what's being said to them. The other thing that's important to consider with framing is headroom. You want to make sure that you don't totally chop the person's head off and have the frame hit right at the top of their head and you also don't wanna leave you know, lots and lots of room at the top of the frame because it feels empty and it doesn't look natural. I find that a helpful rule to make sure that you have comfortable headroom is to imagine the fist of the person you're filming being on top of their head like this and the top of that hand should be pretty close to the top of the frame. That's gonna give them room to move forward and back without cutting off and it's also not too much room that it looks empty. Another rule to keep in mind when filming is called the rule of thirds. Essentially what this rule says is that if you're to take your image and put two vertical lines through it and two horizontal lines through it, so you have nine boxes, 
it's going to be pleasing to the eye if you put your subject at the intersections of those boxes. No one really knows why, it doesn't really matter. You just need to know that this is a pleasing framing setup. So I would recommend putting that grid on your camera, even if it's your phone, you can usually put a grid on your viewfinder to help you navigate setting your scene so that you have things balanced. No matter if you're shooting a talking head video or a highlight video or shooting a worship set, putting those grids on your viewfinder is going to be a really helpful handrail for you to know where to frame your subjects, especially if you're really new at this and don't have an eye for what looks good. Hopefully you guys are hanging in there. I know we are covering a ton, so fortunately you can always save this video and go back to everything we covered. So far we talked about camera bodies, lenses, framing, frame rates, resolution. A lot of the stuff has been uh, oriented towards uh, the gear and just getting the frame of your image properly. But now we have to talk about a very, very important aspect of filmmaking, and that is light. And when it comes to light, there are different variables that you can alter as, your, as a camera operator. You can alter the settings in the camera, and those are your exposure settings, or you can alter the, the lighting in your environment with fixtures as well as using natural light. So that's what we're gonna dive into in this next section of the training. First, let's talk about the essential elements of exposure. So the three factors that go into exposing your image are aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Aperture, like we've already talked about, is how wide open or stop down that aperture ring inside your lens is, which is going to affect how much light comes through for your sensor to work with. For video, shutter speed is actually a little bit more complicated than it seems, and it's kind of beyond the scope of this training. So we recommend just let your camera do the math for you and don't get into full manual mode. Let the camera determine your shutter speed for you based on your other settings like aperture. Lastly, we have ISO or gain, depending on what camera you are using. ISO and gain work essentially by amplifying electronically the signal hitting your sensor the same way that your soundboard amplifies the sound coming into it to make it louder. This can be super useful if you're in a setting that's low light and you don't want to use a super shallow depth of field, but you need your image to be brighter. You have to be very careful though, because the more ISO that you use, the more distortion you're gonna see in your image, and there is a threshold where it starts to look worse than if you had left it lower and used some other means to brighten your image like like using more external light or stopping your aperture down to be more open. Spencer already alluded to the fact that you can use full manual mode on your camera and have full control over aperture, ISO, as well as shutter speed. But I would recommend not doing that if you are new to filmmaking. Um, sure, you're gonna wanna experiment and learn how to be able to adjust those settings quickly on the fly. But if you're just looking to get going um, and you just kinda want a more simplified setting that's not fully automatic, then we recommend putting your camera in aperture priority mode. That means you control the aperture um, and really like how much that ring is opening up in the lens so you can really have more creative control of do you want a blurry background? Do you want to have everything in focus? Um, and then the camera will then go ahead and automatically adjust the ISO and shutter speed um, accordingly so that it's going to give you that balanced image based on your aperture setting. I think this is a nice hybrid between not being fully automatic because often that's not going to look great or not going uh, fully manual because it just might be a little bit uh, too difficult to be able to do that quickly and efficiently if you're new to filmmaking. So put it in aperture priority mode. Now that we've talked about exposure in camera, let's talk about using external lights to change the way that our image looks. There's a lot of different ways to light a scene based on how you want it to look, how you want it to feel, do you want it to be high key, low key, all sorts of stuff. But to keep it simple, the three point lighting setup is going to be a consistent way for you to get a great looking image. The idea with a three-point lighting setup is that you have obviously three lights. The first light is called your key light. This is your primary light source and it's providing the majority of the light in the scene. You want this to be on one side or the other of your subject so there's a little bit of contour to the face. The second light in your setup is the fill light. This helps balance the shadows on the other side of the face of your subject so that it's not so harsh and you can adjust whether you want this to be bright or dark based on the mood you want for your scene. The final light in the setup is what's called a hair light. This is a light, any kind of light, whether it's from a ceiling light or it's a light you provide or it's even a window that provides some kind of light to the top of your subject's head. 
This has the effect of separating your subject from what's behind them by creating a sense of depth. This is really important for having a nicely lit image so that it doesn't look two dimensional. You can find some really affordable bi-color LED lighting kits on Amazon. So the brand I like that's really budget friendly but looks great is the newer brand of lights. I think that's how you pronounce it. Of course, we're gonna link that below uh, this video, but these LED panels can actually change color temperature. So they can have a whiter look, which is a cooler temperature, or a more uh, yellow look, which is a warmer temperature. And in this setup you're seeing right now, we have our uh, key light and our fill light set to a cooler, um, whiter temperature. And then we have our hair light is a bit warmer and that helps uh, create that separation that Spencer was talking about. You don't necessarily have to get all three lights to get going. Have at least one good light source and the good news is you don't even have to have an actual lighting fixture. If you just have a great window in whatever space that you're filming, especially if you're filming indoors, windows in natural light can often be the best key lights for filming your subject. And it just so happens a lot of the videos I shoot for this channel when I'm sitting at my desk talking to my camera, I'm just using natural light coming in through the window and no other lighting fixtures. One rookie mistake that we've seen a lot and been guilty of ourselves is what's called mixing light. So light has, like we just talked about, different temperatures and it doesn't really matter what you use as long as you pick something and you run with it. One of the worst things you can do is shoot in a room that say, for example, has a lot of daylight coming in, but you have a lot of yellow light from your studio lights or from the ceiling lights or whatever on your subject. When those light temperatures mix, your camera cannot hold them both and say they're both white. So one of them's gonna look either really, really blue or one's gonna look really, really yellow. When you go into editing, you're going to have to tell your computer what color white is. And if you have two color temperatures in your shot, one of them's gonna look terrible. So it's really important that you get lights that can balance to whatever room you're shooting in and that you're cognizant that you're shooting with one consistent color temperature in your shot so that you don't have a lot of weird color casts in your image when you go to edit. And don't forget the best way to improve both the exposure and lighting for your videos is to smash the like button on this video. So, so far in this training, we have covered pretty much all things video, how to create a high quality image. But that is only half of the picture, pun intended. Uh, you also have the audio that comes into play when you're producing professional video for your church. So now we're gonna show you how you can both record and then edit high quality audio for your viewers. Like Jake said, it's not just a joke. Audio is 50% of video, and it's a common mistake we see with people who are new to video that they don't put the time or attention to make their audio sound great, and it's really distracting to your audience when things sound poor. So there's a couple of easy ways to fix that problem. The number one reason that we've seen that people have bad audio is that they just don't use microphones. A lot of cameras do have a built-in microphone, but that is a terrible idea to use as your microphone for video because those are really low quality and they're honestly just good for syncing up an external mic later on. And let's just show you an example. Right now, you're listening to the microphone that's built into the camera that we're recording this on. And now you're listening to the microphone, this lav mic that I have clipped to my shirt and notice the difference. When it comes to microphones, there are two main kinds that you can use for video. The first is a lapel or lavalier mic, which Jake and I are both wearing right now. And then the second kind is what's called a shotgun mic. Here's where a lav mic comes in handy. At our church, for a lot of the videos we're producing, it's our pastor who is the primary talking head on camera, and he is preaching his sermons. He's actually going on location to different places, especially right now as we're producing online-only services. And a lav mic will give your subject the flexibility to move around wherever they need to, and you're not having to worry about someone holding your shotgun mic and following that person and trying to mic them that way. So a lav mic can come in handy for just giving your subject more of that flexibility of movement. The other kind of microphone that you can work with is called a shotgun microphone, and they generally look like this. They're barrel shaped, and the reason is they only pick up what they're pointing at. They won't pick up what's on either side of them, so they're very directional. This is valuable because if you put them on top of your camera or you put them on a boom stand just out of frame, they're only gonna pick up what they're pointing at, which would be your subject. This allows you to mic from a distance and still have a nice clean signal without having to have a mic in the shot. This is really helpful if you're working with a subject who's wearing a turtleneck or a blouse or uh, a plain t-shirt like he is. Or a plain t-shirt like I'm wearing right now, uh, which is just a little bit awkward. If you have a, uh, someone wearing a jacket or a button up, it's really easy to clip a mic to them. 
but that can be a challenge. So here are the actual gear recommendations we have for shotgun mics. If you wanna have an on-camera mic, that's great for like vlogging and kind of doing stuff on the fly. I recommend this Deity microphone. Also Rode makes the Video Mic Pros. Um, and then when it comes to studio shotgun mics, there's a Sennheiser shotgun mic that I also love and that we use here at our studio to film courses and such. And then when it comes to the lav mics, we're actually wearing the lav mic we recommend. Uh, it's the Tascam DR. 10L. It is a lav microphone that it's not wireless. It just records directly to a micro SD card in the body pack. And this works really, really great. You don't have to worry about wireless radio interruptions in your audio recording. And most editing software makes it really easy to sync that audio up with your video file in post-production. When you're recording audio, it's important that you record the right level of signal because audio is a lot harder to fix in editing than video. So you wanna make sure you give yourself the best signal that you can to work with. Generally speaking, if you have a meter on your recording device, whether it's in your camera or it's an external recorder or it's a body pack, there should be a meter on there that shows dBs with a negative value going up to zero. You want to aim to record between negative 12 and negative 6 dB at the loudest. Hitting that range with your peaks is going to make sure that you don't clip your signal, but that it's loud enough so that you have a good, clean signal to work with and aren't picking up a lot of background noise. If you're not careful and your audio levels exceed zero decibels, it's going to clip, it's gonna distort, it's gonna sound horrible. One thing I like to do whenever I'm filming a subject, I tell them, hey, talk the loudest you're gonna talk or talk like you're excited or something like that so that I know the, the loudest volume they're gonna be speaking at and then I can set my levels accordingly and make sure you know the, the, the peak of their audio is going to about minus six and that gives us plenty of headroom um, to ensure that it's not going to clip while we actually record. So once you've got your audio recorded and you're ready to put it in your editor, there's some simple steps we can take to make that audio sound really, really good. The easiest thing that we're gonna do is EQ your vocal track, whether it's speaking or even singing, we're gonna do some stuff to that vocal track to make it sound better than just straight out of the microphone. So while you may have a good microphone, you may have used it properly, it's not gonna sound as good as it could if, unless you put an EQ on it. We don't need to get into a whole masterclass on mixing, but there's some simple things you can do to make a good vocal EQ. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is put what's called a high pass filter or a low cut on that signal and basically cut the low frequencies out of that voice because they're not even in there in the first place, but it'll take out a bunch of noise you don't need. And I usually cut up to maybe 125 hertz or so, depending on male or female voice. And then we wanna also cut out about five to 700 hertz. This is a really boxy and muddy sounding frequency that if you grab that and kind of pull it down, maybe six dB and maybe what's right next to it, um, you're gonna instantly hear a much clearer sound from your voice. And then I also boost between two and 4K and sometimes even above that because that brings out the diction and sibilance of the mouth, which you can hear when you're in person having a conversation with somebody and you wanna recreate that in your video so that it sounds engaging to the person watching and they want to keep watching because it feels like a real conversation. So here's what my lav microphone sounds like with no audio processing on it, no EQ. And now here's what it sounds like when we added that low cut in, we pulled down uh, the 500 hertz range and maybe also boosted the four to 5K range as well. If you like what you hear, smash that like button. If you're trying to produce music videos to capture worship and share that online, then a key step there is gonna be capturing a multi-track recording of your worship band. That's gonna give you the ability to then, you know, pull that audio into Pro Tools or Ableton or Logic Pro and then mix it down so it sounds really professional and really clear um, for your end product. And we have lots of other videos on this channel that you can explore when it comes to capturing high quality multi-track audio of your band, so definitely check those out. It's very common in a good idea to have some background music for some of your talking head video that you're creating for your church. But you wanna make sure that that music complements the video and doesn't like take over or distract from the person talking. If you're looking for a great source of royalty-free music that you can license for your church's videos, 
Check out themusicbed.com as well as epidemicsound.com. Uh, there's various other platforms as well. Those are my two favorite ones. Those websites have a lot of instrumental music, so I recommend you know not playing music that actually has like lyrics and singing going on in the background. I think it's distracting when you have that going, especially uh, under someone who's trying to talk or speak uh, in your video. And then the other tip I have is make sure that background music isn't too loud. And you can also adjust the EQ of that background music to complement the person who is talking. What I mean by this is on the audio file for your music, uh, add the EQ uh, settings on there so you can adjust your EQ and then pull down the about you know 2K to 5K Hertz uh, range of EQ so that that's going to make space for the clarity of that voice to cut through the mix and it's going to pull down that same frequency range uh, within the music. So then you're just gonna be able to hear your person talking more clearly over that audio file. So far we covered how to capture high quality video, how to capture high quality audio, but that's only about two thirds of the process. Now we have the final portion of this training which is editing. There's quite a bit of work that is gonna have to be done in what we call post-production after the actual production of the content, you bring it into post-production to edit the content down into the final product. First, we're gonna give you an overview of the best video editing software that's available, and then Spencer's actually gonna hop behind his computer and give you a tutorial of a basic editing workflow um, for a video that he actually created for a church, so you guys can see what this will actually look like, and he's gonna save you a ton of time with some tips there. So first, let's dive into video editing software. There are a couple big players out there. Um, first you have Final Cut Pro X, which is kind of the pro level video editing software for Mac. Um, it is a paid video editing software. Uh, it's the software that I use, Spencer uses it. We really like it. It's powerful, but it's also very intuitive and user friendly, which is kind of the, the whole mantra uh, with a lot of Mac software and hardware. You also have Premiere Pro. Um, that's also a very amazing video editing software. It's used by lots of professionals out there, um, and I highly recommend it. I don't use it myself, but it is a great tool. A lot of people love it. But then there are some free options. If you're on a Mac, you can just use iMovie. iMovie is almost just as powerful as Final Cut Pro is. I actually probably don't even know why I use Final Cut Pro just because I want, to, I want to make myself feel like a pro. Uh, but you can also use iMovie when it comes to just dragging in basic you know, video files, your audio files, and making cuts and transitions. iMovie can do it all for free. And then another free video editing software that's cross-platform for Mac and PC is DaVinci Resolve, which is made by the folks at Blackmagic Design. I honestly don't want to make that strong of a recommendation for either one of those pieces of software because I know many people get great results with all of them. So the most important thing is just to pick one and learn it. Speaking of learning it, I'm gonna take you guys into my computer now and we're gonna go through a start to finish workflow for a simple pre-roll online service video that I made for a church in the area. We're gonna be using Final Cut Pro 10, but the workflow should be the same no matter what editor you're using. So let's jump in and let's take a look at it. All right, so now that we've jumped into my computer, I'm gonna show you guys just really rapidly how I go through the process of making a talking head video. This is a video for a church client um, that's wanting to run a pre-roll for their online service. So I shot this a couple of days ago and I'm gonna put it together and I'm gonna show you guys kind of in you know a quick way the general flow of steps I take to get something from a bunch of files on my hard drive to a finished product. So the first thing we need to do is I've already imported and organized everything. So I've got my assets folder or event here. I just name it assets. I don't name it by the date. Um, and then I make sure everything is subfoldered. So I make subfolders for different stuff. We shot, I think, five or six of these videos all at once. Um, and so I'm going to work on Tim's. So I put all of Tim's files in here. This file accidentally made its way in here. Uh, this is somebody else's recording, but this is the external recording audio for Tim. And then this is the camera file. So this is going to have the camera mic and the, obviously the image right there. And then this is the microphone that we had. That's a shotgun mic. That's the audio I want to use. So I need to combine these two. So what I'm going to do is select both of them. I'm going to right click and I'm going to tell the computer to synchronize these clips. Um, I'm going to reset the time code to zero and then everything else looks good. I want to keep this at 4K. I'll make the project smaller, but I don't want the clip to get degraded on its own. So I'm just going to do that. And now it's done. 
So I'm going to drop this inside my keyword folder so that I don't lose it. And then I've just made a project called Tim. It's got nothing in it. And I'm going to hit this, hit the E button, and that's going to drop that right in there. And that looks all good. So now what I need to do is scrub through this footage and find which take I want to use. So I, it looks like we've got a partial take, a first maybe full take, and then a second full take here. So I usually use the last one, but let's just scrub through and I'm going to double check all that. All right. I like this take the best. This is a full complete take. I don't have to do really any cuts unless I want to. So I'm just going to go to the beginning of that. I'm going to cut everything else out and I'm going to cut at the end and zoom that out. And this is basically my take right here. So I'm going to throw a quick cross dissolve on the front of this. Maybe shorten that up just a little bit. That looks about right. I'll deal with the end later. Um, I don't need this pane right now. Um, and so I'm going to get rid of that just to keep my workspace clean. Now I'm going to mix his voice over real quick. Um, so what I'm going to do is go to my effects panel and I've got a, in the voice section, I have a preset called male voiceover right here. Um, this is an EQ and a compressor in one, so I'm going to drop that on there. And it should take effect. And once I pull my inspector pane up, um, I should be able to see that voiceover enhancement right here. I'm going to bring my scopes up as well, Shift-Command-8 for Final Cut Pro. So I should be able to see my levels. Okay, so I'm going to level check this real quick. And you can help us do that by clicking on the connection link in the comment section. All right, so it's it's not bad, but it's a little bit low. So what I'm going to do is go to the compressor um, here. Now, the compressor is not engaging until about minus 10, but I don't really want to compress this very much because I want it louder. So I'm going to raise the threshold to minus 8 so that it doesn't even engage until it's about that loud. And then I'm going to add some makeup gain. So maybe I'll go up to 4. Um, and that should add some volume to this track. I'm going to just really quickly check the EQ. This is a preset for most male vocals. Um, I kind of like this. So cutting the mud out here, I don't like uh, this 2K on this microphone. Um, I do like a little bit of lower end, and I like some of this. And I'm actually going to pull this down a little bit because there's some buzzing from the lights in this room uh, that we couldn't get to turn off. So I think that'll work all right right there. And then to make this louder, um, because I need to add some volume, I'm going to use the loudness tool, which works also like a compressor, not super aggressive. Um, and that's going to bump that up. And let's see where we are now. In the comment section, and we'll get back to you and, and help you get connected. All right, so let's add a little bit more, maybe 3 dB. And let's see how this sounds. And we'll get back to you and, and help you get connected and serve you in any way that we can. All right, so it's right about minus 6. Um, I don't know about you, but with my nice you know, monitoring headphones on, I can really hear the buzz of those lights. I'm going to try noise removal real quick. Let's see how this sounds. In the comment section, and we'll get back to you and, and help you get connected and serve you in any way that we can. Also, if you have a prayer request today... It's all right. Uh, I think it's better at 50, but it also really changes the voice at 50. That's pretty good right there. All right, now that I got his voiceover in a good spot, it's leveled, it's EQ'd, it's compressed, and it's uh, sounding pretty good and clean, and I took take some of that background noise out, I'm going to go add some music. So I have a music and graphics subfolder. This song section works really well, um, and so I'm going to just, I've already selected it, I know it works, I'm going to drop this in, and luckily this clip is shorter than this uh, music track so that means I don't have to go loop a section because uh, right past where I cut this off this song really jams and totally changes character um, and I don't want that in there so thankfully I won't have to do much with that um, I do want to make it start a little bit quicker um, so what I'm going to do to make it fit is I'm just going to go straight to minus 15 um, on the dB scale there I'm going to stretch this out just a little bit, and then I'm going to EQ the music. So I'm going to pull 2K down and go about halfway on 1K and 4K um, to just help the voice pop through, and I'm going to give this a listen. Good morning, Deer Creek Church. Thanks for joining us online. All right. It's not bad. I think it's a little bit loud, so I'm going to pull that down just a little bit more. Welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. We would love to... 
Okay, so what I'm going to do, because I hate using noise removal, is I'm going to put this down to 40 and see if I can hear that humming now. Thanks for joining us. We would love to connect with you, and you can help us do that by clicking... If I really listen for it, I can, but honestly, I have to really listen for it. Most people watching this are not going to be listening for it because they're going to be listening to him talk. So I think I can get away with pulling this down to 40 because it doesn't distort his voice as much, and I just really hate when that happens. Now, I'm going to zoom in here, and what I like to do is use R, to my range tool, to create a keyframe to make this music come in. Uh, maybe minus, yeah, let's try this. Good morning, Deer Creek Church. Thanks for joining. So it's kind of subtle, but what I want the music to do is start off strong, and then when the when the speaking begins, kind of go to the background. So I uh, spread these out a little bit so it's not so sudden. Good morning, Deer Creek Church. Thanks for joining. That's pretty good. I honestly want to pull this down even more to minus 21, um, so let's do that. Creek Church, thanks for joining us online. If this is your first experience with us... That will work. Now when I go to the end to get this to fade out properly, um, what I want to have happen is right as he's about finished talking, I'm going to do the exact same thing and bump this back up to minus seven, six, whatever, eight or so. And then I also want to grab this at the end and bring this crossfade over and apply that. And I will right click on that and switch what kind of crossfade it is. And let's try linear so it's not so sudden because it is kind of short. And let's see how this sounds. Chip, welcome to Deer Creek Church. Okay, so let's, uh, that is a little bit rapid of an increase. Let's try this. Chip, welcome to Deer Creek Church. Okay, and you can hear the humming there, but we are going to throw a crossfade there to black. Um, but I think I need a little bit more room there so it doesn't cut him off while he's still talking. There we go. All right, let's try this. For joining us for worship, welcome to Deer Creek Church. Now, I'm not going to throw an end graphic on here because this is a service pre-roll. If this was rolling in a Sunday service, um, normally I'd put a little like Deer Creek Church graphic right here and stretch this ending out a little bit just as a transitional spot so that if they're doing a live you know, announcement as this video is wrapping up, there's a little bit of space. It doesn't end so abruptly, but it doesn't seem to make sense to me on a pre-roll to do that because... Um, it's going to go straight into a sermon or into another announcement. I don't need to throw their church graphic on there. Everybody knows who they're watching right now. So I'm going to consider that pretty much done. This is cut pretty well. Um, as far as it being one take, uh, Tim's really good at doing things in one take. So I don't need to really cut any sections out. And it's so short, 45 seconds. I'm not going to uh, just create artificial cuts to punch in and punch out because I just really don't feel like that's necessary. So what I need to do now, because I've got the voiceover sounding good, music sounding good, I'm going to color correct uh, this shot. So um, I'm going to go into my, my color editor here. I'm going to get rid of this pings. I don't really need it anymore. Actually, I also need to make sure that I crop this. I shot this in extra wide, um, and so I need to get rid of those bars on the top and bottom. And so now I've got it fitting the frame properly. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to make some adjustments to the white balance because I feel like this was shot a little bit yellow, um, which sometimes happens. It looks different in frame. And because that adds a lot of magenta by sliding that to the left, I'm going to compensate by using my tint slider to add some green, which is opposite of magenta. So basically taking that magenta out and I can kind of play with these back and forth to get this to be a little bit more balanced tone. So I think that's a lot better. If I want to check my work, I can turn this off, go to the balance color tool, see what the computer thinks of that. Um, and that's what it's automatically going to guess. And if I say white balance, I'm going to click something that's white. Um, and I think I missed right there. So it's kind of a stretch. There's not really anything that should be pure white in this shot necessarily. Um, so I'm not really a fan of that. So let's go back to automatic. Um, and then if I turn that off and go back to color wheels, pretty close. So I'm going to stick to the color wheels. I'm going to keep working on that. So I feel like there's still a little bit of odd uh, color tone in this. So I'm going to go a little bit farther left in the temperature slider and chase it a little bit more. Maybe bring that back. So I'm going to tweak this. Um, and I'm going to dial these colors in a little bit.
All right, I'm also going to take the extra step of adding a grade to this. So I've corrected it. I think this is nice and balanced. And then I'm going to go add a what's called a LUT, which is a lookup table. Um, I'm going to drag and drop that on the clip right there. I've got a bunch of these loaded in. There are some um, that I bought a while ago that I really like the look of. That's definitely way too aggressive. So I'm going to pull that back uh, maybe to 0.5. That looks better. Um, and uh, you can buy these on Gamut, G-A-M-U-T, um, but Lutify.me, and there's a bunch of other sites, you can buy LUTs. They will kind of give a look to your um, footage. Instead of just balancing it, it'll actually give it kind of a tone and style. So I'm going to just compensate for what I did here a little bit, and then we'll be done with color. Okay, I'm pretty happy with this. This looks good. Last thing I need to do is add some titles. So I am going to uh, open this pane once more and I'm going to go grab a title template that I bought a while back. I'm going to insert that. Um, and then what I'm going to do is close that out is just edit it to say what I want. So I'm going to put his name in there. All right, let's check this out. Good morning, Deer Creek Church. Thanks for joining us online. Okay, now that I've got that done, I have got my title in place. I've got this wrapping up, ending the way I want, and it's going to sound nice. I've got the voiceover mixed. I've got the music cut and mixed, and I've got the colors corrected and graded. Uh, this project is ready to export. So there you have it. Start to finish, really quick, simple edit. And if you follow those steps in that order, you are going to have a much easier time getting a consistently good result. And that brings us to the end of the ultimate guide to video production for churches. If you found this video helpful, just please just go ahead and smash that thumbs up button. Um, we really do hope that this has brought you so much clarity and direction in terms of how to just build the right setup to capture some high quality videos for your congregation so that you can further the kingdom of God for your church and your community. And of course, there's so much more to learn about video production for your church. And I wanna encourage you to go subscribe to Spencer's channel, Church Video School, here on YouTube. He's producing new content on a regular basis. It's gonna help you make better videos for your church. Spencer also has his church video production toolkit linked below in this description. So this is gonna be a toolkit that he'll be regularly updating and revising. It's one convenient place for you to access all of Spencer's recommended gear for your church. And if you would like to explore this topic further and get more advanced training from Spencer, check out his online course that we also linked below. Spencer, tell us what you cover in that course. Yeah, so it's called the Beginner's Guide to Church video course, and it's a workflow course to help you figure out from pre-production and scripting and location scouting to editing and delivery, how to make a quality professional video. So very similar to what we covered today, but we're gonna go more in depth. You're gonna get screen shares of how I edit. You're going to get really in depth on how everything works together and how to use your gear and how to take the right steps in the right order so that you can make a really great video and save yourself a lot of time in the process. So go subscribe to Spencer's channel, go check out his online course. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you found it helpful, one last time, smash that like button, share it with your friends in ministry, and don't forget to subscribe to our Churchfront channel so you don't miss out on any of our latest videos to help you grow yourself and grow your church.